The history of technology and education began when humans first used tools in an attempt to communicate and share or memorialize information. From the writing slate to the electronic tablet, from the printing press to the fastest computer, history has seen many innovations in educational technology. This includes computing devices such as the abacus from 3000 BC, the calculator that dates back to the 1500s, and the punch card devices of the 19th century. And in 1906, American physicist Lee DeForest invented the vacuum tube. This led to the construction of the first generation tube-based mainframe. These are but a few technologies of the past that have had an impact on the future of education. But we begin our modern history of technology in education in 1910, when the public school system in Rochester, New York, began using film as a medium for instruction. A movement had begun. Out of this grew journals that specialized in visual instruction, and professional enrichment organizations were established on a national scale. In addition, teachers' colleges were founded to train instructors in new approaches to visual learning. In 1923, the National Education Association, the NEA, formed the Division of Visual Instruction, DVI. They focused their attention on enhancing education through the implementation of slideshows and motion pictures. In the 1920s, Sidney Pressey invented the mechanical teaching machine. The device resembled a typewriter and could be programmed to automate multiple choice questions. The new technology provided instant answers for teachers and learners. The belief was that stimulus response associations could be improved through repetition accompanied by immediate feedback. Unfortunately, the growth of Pressey's invention stalled during the Great Depression of the 1930s. As the unemployment rate rose, the development of technology in education fell. However, the 30s did bring us organizations such as the National Advisory Council on Radio in Education, the NACRE, the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, and the National Committee on Education by Radio, the NCER. Students were now able to listen to lectures over the radio. By 1933, schools were making wide use of films to educate. As we move into the 1940s, the first electronic computers begin to appear. And it was the war years from 1941 to 1945 that saw the first broad use of educational technologies in the United States. During this time, the American military employed a variety of audiovisual technologies to rapidly train thousands of new recruits in the implementation of sophisticated weaponry. This was a very productive time for the evolution of technology and education. The Division of Visual Aids for War Training, a part of the U.S. Office of Education, produced over 1,200 movies, film strips, and teacher's manuals. During these years, they also purchased 55,000 projectors. Excellence in military training proved to be a shining example of what a national educational effort could accomplish. They continued to pioneer many new technologies in the post-war years, 
As a result, the military became a model for the use of innovative technology and instructional approaches. Schools and companies began implementing these new technologies and approaches to learning. Consequently, a demand grew for professionals who could navigate this new age in education and training. The new professionals, instructional technologists, were highly sought after. They specialized in design and development. In addition, they were trained in the utilization, management, and evaluation of processes and resources for learning. This profession continues to expand even today. In 1945, Vannevar Bush published his seminal essay, As We May Think, in which he envisioned the MIMEX, a machine designed to extend the human memory by storing and retrieving associated documents in the same way the brain would. This type of document association, or linking, was later formalized and became known as hypertext. Even though Bush died before Internet connectivity was born, his vision laid the cognitive groundwork that led inventors to construct the World Wide Web. During the 1940s, overhead projectors were cutting-edge technology. As they were added to the mix, along with slide and film projectors, methods for use in education needed to be outlined. In 1946, Edgar Dale published a textbook on audiovisual methods in teaching. In it, he introduced the Cone of Experience, a visual device that illustrated his classification system for different types of mediated learning experiences. It is based on the relationships of various educational experiences to reality. The most concrete experiences were located at the bottom of the cone, and the most abstract experiences were located at the top. In the mid-1940s, a calculator called ENIAC was invented at the University of Pennsylvania. It could multiply raw numbers at a rate much faster than previous machines. Soon, the UNIVAC was invented and the U.S. Census Bureau took notice and used it to categorize and catalog massive amounts of information. The CBS TV network used the UNIVAC computer to crunch the first poll numbers for the 1952 U.S. presidential election. Their correct prediction of the winner changed TV election coverage forever. Several manufacturers, led by IBM, produced large mainframe computers in the 1950s. In the early 21st century, computers can fit into the palm of our hand. But six decades ago, they were enormous behemoths that occupied large warehouses. One brilliant invention at Bell Laboratories in New Jersey in 1947 changed that, the transistor. The transistor eliminated inefficient and cumbersome mechanical relays and vacuum tubes. In 1955, the first computer to use the transistor technology appeared. Three years later, a researcher at the Texas Instruments Lab named Jack Kilby made a dramatic discovery. He proved that a tiny wafer of semiconductor substance could support multiple sets of transistors. This would economize the use of space and would be heralded as the integrated circuit. Suddenly, the possibility of a much smaller computer with increased power opened up new horizons in technology. However, compared to today's technology, 
computers in the late 1950s were still in their infancy. An example of the then and the now could be the highly regarded computer of the 1950s, the PDP-1. Developed by Digital Equipment Corporation, it had a memory of 9 kilobytes. Information was gathered on paper tape that would be perforated. By comparison, 1,000 kilobytes are needed by a 2012 computer to store just one photograph. Since the PDP-1 was the giant of its time, its cost of over $100,000 did not discourage buyers. The PDP-1 was the computer used for the initial video game. And what was the name of that game? Space War. Benjamin Bloom was an educational psychologist who believed in a mastery approach to learning. He maintained that instruction should address the learner's needs and be varied based on those needs in terms of time, instructional approach, and content. In 1956, Bloom published his taxonomy, which had far-reaching effects on instructional design and the hierarchy of teaching and learning. His taxonomy consisted of six levels of intellectual skills and behaviors deemed important to learning. The six cognitive levels are knowledge, comprehension, application, analysis, synthesis, and evaluation. According to his taxonomy, the learner's growth begins with basic knowledge and proceeds upward to the highest level, which is evaluation. B.F. Skinner also had a major influence on education. He was a radical behaviorist who invented a new technology designed to accelerate teaching and learning. He called it programmed instruction. The idea was to break instructional content into small units of learning, then provide incentives and rewards for success. Very often, this method involved self-teaching with specialized materials, and the learners were to progress at their own pace. In many ways, modern approaches to education using technology have their roots in Bloom's taxonomy and Skinner's programmed instruction, which we now call computer-based training, or web-based training. As in the past, the course designer divides content to be learned into manageable chunks. Seymour Papert was born in South Africa in 1928, but has lived in the United States for much of his life. In France, Papert had the opportunity to work with Jean Piaget, the radical theorist who was fascinated by how mathematics develops in the minds of children. Influenced by some of Piaget's theories, Papert developed his own while at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 1963. Papert devised the Logo programming language in conjunction with children's toys, which had computational power already built into the system. Without knowing a binary language or the highly technical apparatus, children could still program the complex toy. Being an advocate of the constructionist theory, Papert believed that technology, such as robotic manipulatives, could be used by children. With these devices, children could design meaningful projects. And to Papert, 
Meaningful projects are the kind that take the act of thinking forward to the act of doing. Papert regretted that the modern computer is now taken for granted so much that few remember that it was once a majestic idea in the minds of inquisitive scientists just a few decades ago. This powerful concept was shared by many brilliant people in different corners of the globe. In the future, Papert thinks that sharing knowledge is the most natural way to acquire knowledge. Children will either search out this knowledge by themselves or search for it among their peers. As an example, Papert believes that video games teach children what computers are starting to teach adults. That some parts of learning are rapid fire, intriguing, and rewarding. Often with kids, learning video games can be hard work, but it can also be fun. Papert saw Logo as a tool to advance the way children think and solve problems. His Logo Turtle was a small robot invented to help children create situations that could then be solved. Papert was also a principal in the One Laptop Per Child project. He has been called one of the greatest living math educators. In 1893, 16 years after the invention of the first audio device, the phonograph, commercial record sets of Spanish and English as foreign languages became available. These records were used in regular classes and for home self-study. The first facility that was used strictly for foreign language study was at the University of Grenoble in France in 1908. Three years later, this practice was introduced in the United States at Washington State College. About this same time, the U.S. Military and Naval Academy employed separate rooms to listen to foreign language records. But it wasn't until after World War II that the beginning of the modern language laboratory movement took hold, with the construction of a full lab at Louisiana State University in 1946. It became standard practice henceforth to construct soundproof rooms for listening. It was also at this time magnetic tape and tape recording machines replaced phonographs whose drawbacks included fragility and poor fidelity. There was a very dramatic increase in language labs due to the generous funding support of the federal government with passage of the National Defense Education Act in 1958. From that year, the number of language labs increased from 64 in U.S. secondary schools to 6,000 in 1964. Post-secondary labs also flourished at this time when matching funds became available in the Higher Education Act of 1965. For these reasons, the 1960s are considered the apex in the evolution of the language lab. In the 1970s, the cassette replaced the reel-to-reel -reel tape. By the middle of the decade, fast-forward capability, slow-down, expander, and rewind added greatly to a language learner's options. The evaporation of funding meant fewer language labs were initiated in the 1970s and early 80s. However, this changed in the mid-80s when computers began to influence the scene. In 1983, the Computer Assisted Language Learning and Instruction Consortium was founded. This group was dominated by language educators and their enthusiastic support of computers meant that the computer was the way of the future. Language labs are responsible for the single largest investment and installation of audio resources in the field of education.